today, Ben and I. It's a really great pleasure for us to be here. And I would just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we stand, the Muwanina people, and to really mourn the fact that there are no living descendants of the Muwanina, the people who lived where Hobart now stands, Nikaluna Hobart. And sad to say, it's tragic to say that they had disappeared long before Government House was finished in 1858. In fact, it was in 1848 that the remaining people at Waibalena were moved to Putalina, Oyster Bay. And from there, from time to time, they were brought to Hobart on show, including to Government House. For example, we found this documented that they were brought to Government House, some women, and dressed in ball gowns and really put on show at Government House. And this was reported in the papers of the day. And I imagine this happened on other occasions as well. And looking back at our Aboriginal history, it's really a tragic counterpoint to the story of Government House. Thank you, Kate. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I obviously concur with those words of Kate's regarding our Indigenous people and their, their very sad history um, and their very brave um, efforts to, to, to look after themselves. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I first of all thank Mary Kuhlhoff and colleagues for this wonderful invitation. Uh, Kate and I have been looking forward to um, sharing this, um, this PowerPoint uh, session with you this afternoon. Um, it certainly is a remarkable story, and so I, get, I think we both feel pretty honoured that we were in a position where we could say, well, shall we try and do a history of Government House Tasmania, being not least because it is the only Government House that did not have an official history, with the exception of a charming little 1961 book by Amy Rowntree of about 60 pages. So in fact, it's the second, but it certainly is the first one of, of any substance. Yes. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to then do this talk by means of a PowerPoint. I expect that it would take about 35 minutes or so, and we will be more than happy afterwards if anyone's got any questions to fire away at us. So we'll start with the very first one. Yes. Okay, now, I'm sure you all know that the first government house was built more or less where the town hall um, and um, Franklin Square are. It looked nice, but it was a, a pretty ramshackle building. And when um, Governor Lachlan Macquarie was first here in 1810-11, he was very disparaging about the town and he set out the grid roads that we have today. And he said, you need a new government point and it needs to be at Macquarie Point. And that was the way it was for a long, long time. That would have solved a lot of problems. It today. certainly would have. <laughs> That's right. So then, um, when Lieutenant Governor George Arthur became the Lieutenant Governor in 1824, 1824 to 1836, um, the first thing he did was to ignore the instructions to put Government House at Macquarie Point. And he instead said, well, there's a beautiful quarry up on the domain, and I think that's where our Government House should be. Now, this image is an 1827 painting by George William Evans, who happened to be the surveyor. And we have, I've read works by art experts saying they don't quite know what it is. It doesn't look where the Queen's battery is. I'm of the opinion, and it can only be of an opinion, that that might be the foundations of the very first government house. And with the gentleman on the extreme right of the painting in the fancy clothes being the architect John Lee Archer. There's no proof of that. The image simply says, um, you know, Van Diemen's Land, Government House, Town. But in the absence of any other building, what could it possibly be with that degree, uh, all those planks laid out and so on and so forth? That's what we think, don't we? We do. Okay, so. On we go. Yes, well, this is a rather charming um, drawing. Is it a drawing and a painting? It's, it's I think it's a colour. pencil. I think it's a pen pencil. sketch. Yeah. We're not entirely sure, yes. but it's very beautiful. It is. And it's by Emily Bowring. And it was finished, well, it's said to be done in 1858. And this is in the Allport Library, I think, isn't it? Uh, yes, this is an Allport yes. Library original, yeah. So that was a wonderful find, to find such an early image of Government House. 
and it's before the Quatrefoil Wall was built that you're probably all aware of as you come up to the, the door at Government House on the side where cars mm. are often parked. Mm. So it is a really early image. And even earlier, mm. we found, or David found another painting um, mm. done by William Porton Kay, but that yes, was indeed. 1860. So we think this is really the earliest image of Government House. And you can see really, it's the, exactly the same from that angle yeah. as today, apart from the, the garden and the landscaping. Yes, so, so it, it, undoubtedly it's, it's the earliest known image. What it may be of interest too is that if you look at the circular uh, flower garden in the foreground, that could well have been planted with the aim of carriages being able to come in, perhaps drop off their cargo and then come back out again. Again, it's pure guesswork, but the fact that it is so singular in the centre there suggests that that might have been its functional purpose. After all, they were very practical people back then. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, number three, it's not only us standing here. Here's a question for you. Who would like to guess what that building is? Come on now, you're all Royal Society of Tasmania members. Uh, it's not actually, although it's got that interesting, humble look. And there should be some northern members here. Ah. Okay, well, look, we'll put you out of your misery. This is a painting from 1812 by the artist J.W. Lewin, and it is the Government House Cottage in Launceston. Yeah. It's a beautiful image, is it not? And it is, um, as you might expect, in the QV Mag collection. Just on that point, there's obviously been agitation from day one for more than just a travelling governor in the north. And it's been a very difficult question to solve. It hasn't been raised for a long time now, but it really was quite an issue. And there's been a lot of historical parliamentary debate about that. Hmm. And there are actually four government houses at that stage. So there was one in Launceston. There was the government cottage at Port Arthur which you've probably all visited when you visited Port Arthur. There's the ruins of it only, but the walls are still standing. Mm. And it's in that very nice position above the garden that runs down to the water. Yeah. And there was a government cottage too at New Norfolk, sort of near where Tariff Lodge is today, but that burnt down. And that was used a lot by the mm -hmm. early governments. Mm. It was, it was a retreat. And I think when Government House was being built, the new Government House, when it wasn't finished, yes. the governor and his family went to they Port Arthur for quite a time. Yes, they it? certainly did. Okay, where are we now? Now, Kate, you are very good at talking about this. This is an 1881 um, illustration, and it's... Is it 81? I think it is. It's 1881. Yes, yes it, is. it is. And that was in the Tasmanian archives, or is yes. in the Tasmanian yes, archives. Yes, that's right. And this was just so useful to us, and to me particularly, because I was responsible more for the garden side of things. And it just had so many clues in this particular plan. So you can see Government House. I think I can move that. So here's Government House here. And um, this is the front gate coming in here down the drive. We know it so well, it's easy for us to say. So have I got it near the government? Your driving the, skills. Kate. My driving skills. So that's the front gate there. And there was just looking at the detail of this plan and, and the writing on it was really amazing. So here are the government house cottages, we call them the cottages today. They're called servant quarters there. So they're exactly still there. But just the labels on all of those buildings were really interesting. So there's, you know, a meat house um, is, is there. And then there's a barn and a cow shed and piggeries, a coal shed. And it was just fascinating to work out what these buildings were used for in 1881. But the first thing that struck me when I looked at this plan was, look at this, there's an oval tennis lawn. And I thought, how amazing, this is 1881 and they've got a tennis court. And I thought, but it's oval, that's a bit odd. And so when I looked up the history of lawn tennis, they were at first oval tennis courts and they started playing on croquet lawns. So they had a tennis a, a tennis lawn there. And this was in the days of Governor uh, Strawn. Uh, just after just World. After, yes. Yes. Uh, so Lefroy and yes. shortly and then. Yes. yes. 
And and before the Hamiltons. Before the Hamiltons. And the Hamiltons were really keen on tennis. So they then built the three tennis courts in the position that they are today. So two um, lawn courts and one, one onto car court and a little tennis shed, which um, is gorgeous. Yes. It's recently renovated. Recently renovated, yeah, that, they date to 1887. Dating back to 1887, mm. yes. Mm. The Hamiltons were there in 1885 to yeah. 1890, yeah. I think. Yes, so... Okay, so that's a wonderful image, that one. Oh, and yes, there was something else on that okay, image that I also okay. noticed, um, which was this fabulous octagonal fowl shed. So we saw that image, and much later, I happened to be mm. just looking at online archives. There's so much detail there. And I found the plans <laughs> of the octagonal fowl shed. So that was there for many years. Unfortunately, we don't have it anymore. It uh, must have become dilapidated and was taken down in the 1920s. Something like that. But I'm, until yeah. then, we could <clears throat> see it in images. So um, the, reason, was... the reason why it, is, it, it was such an interesting building as well. The reason why it was octagonal was that there was quite a trend to breed various types of, of chicken. And so we've, there, is a, there is a map of that which, with the type of bird written in each of the octagonal. Yes, so in really plan. an interesting concept. Yes. And I, I, whether or not, I don't know if chooks have got anything to do with the climatization, but obviously those policies were very big back then. And anything that was exotic and rare that could be brought to this country, that was done. Mm. There's a similar one at Ratho, which is still standing at Bothwell. Okay. So I've seen that and was amazed and thought, isn't it a pity? So we've come back to the 1881 plan. Um, one thing we could mention, Kate, I don't know if we can just look at those three buildings yes, at yes, the bottom. Yes, you, you talk about those. So those three buildings at the bottom there, um, and again, many of you will know this, that in 1841, a magnetic observatory was built up on the domain. And again, this is bef well before Government House was built. But the reason the magnetic observatory was put there is because there's a very deep bed of sandstone all across there. And the magnetic um, instruments were so sensitive that to have them over a sandstone base with minimal metallic interference was, was what that was all about. So those 1841, 42 dwellings are all still there. Um, and most of them are in really good condition, which is obviously very important culturally and historically. Mm. Yes, so I was just going to point out here the quarry pond, which was obviously all um, landscaped by 1881. And we understand that it was Governor Weld who was responsible for doing that landscaping. And he was governor between 1875 and 1880. Yes. <coughs> and we know because he wrote a letter to his wife, he came from Perth, Western Australia, came originally from England, but he had been in, in Perth. And he came to Tasmania before his wife and wrote to her, telling her about the quarry and how he was going to create a wonderful garden there with ferns in the quarry pond. So um, that was sort of an uh, interesting... <clears throat> yes, it was a very significant thing to do because the quarry pond, again, is, is such a such a significant part of the estate. And of course that is where the stone for the house was quarried from. Which is why the house is there. Yes. Now, yes. speaking of the quarry pond, there it is. And the two figures at the bottom left is Sir Henry Fox Young and Lady Fox Young. This photograph, they moved into the building on the 2nd of February, 1858. The first governor, the first vice regal couple. So you can obviously say this is pre-landscaping. Pre-landscaping, yes. But he is the governor who laid the foundation stone for the society, the Royal Society's Museum. So Henry Fox Young. Yeah. So again, this is probably, possibly the earliest known photograph of Government House. And as such, it's of very considerable historic interest. And I'm sure many of you have been to Government House on many times and you would have seen the, the, the very large, uh, it's not a Californian redwood, is it? The Mesa Sequoia? A Sequoia. The Sequoia, very large Sequoia, just on the left at the front. Sequoia it's actually Japan. quite young, but it's still huge. And you can see it had not even been planted there. Yes. And just incidentally, there's many, many images of the quarry pond from this exact spot. 
and you can tell by the height of the tree more or less when the image was taken. And of course, it's much more beautiful today, but it has yes. its, had its moments, hasn't it? Indeed. So at times of, um, when there hasn't been as much money around, austerity, particularly um, before, or what was just before the First World War and during it, hmm. it was really used as a dump and was very neglected. And in fact, there was some kind of policy that things that broke in the house, um, glassware, furniture, lamps, anything they didn't need, they had to dispose of it in the pond, which is very bizarre, but the Auditor General insisted on this. And it wasn't until 1961, mm. yes, that the official secretary wrote to the Auditor General and said, this is ridiculous, having to throw all of the old stuff in the pond, you know, sofas and goodness knows what. He was really worried that it would start to emerge through the surface. Yes, he actually said that. So, and I think the reason why it, the, the pond was used as a dumping ground was because back in those days it would have thought it would have been the worst thing possible if someone was ferreting around the tip and came across a crown on a piece of broken up. <laughs> that was the official reason given. So. And this is the quarry pond today. So that is one of Penn Taylor's images. We asked Penn Taylor to do the photography for our book and she's just done the most amazing Thanks. job. Mm. So we didn't want just historic images, but um, more recent images. So that's a lovely Yes, and that's a delightful little hewn pine boat that was built for Government House by, by prisoners. Uh, we, we've generally always had one or two prisoners who come and work on day release. It's very good for their potential rehabilitation into society. And so we, at some point, I don't know when this was done, but it's a nice piece of creative work yes. for those inmates. Yeah. Just back to the plan again, because I want to also talk about this fernery and rockery at the front gate, because there were some amusing stories about that, but also some really interesting history. So I think it, we'll move on to the images of those yes. rockery. There we are. Yes. There it is. So that is an image of um, Governor Sir Ernest Clark. Clark. Yes, and it is in the 1930s. And he was obviously interested in the rockery and um, was there supervising some, some work in the rockery. And then um, wondering, it doesn't look like anything like that today. We found this, that's the rockery today. That's it today. Yes. And in fact, we can go on to that one. Yes. Which is there. Yes. yes. So that's a painting that I noticed hanging upstairs in a, in a little corner. Of government yes, house that's right. behind the door it was so hidden it was yes so hidden and then realized by looking at the rocks and comparing them that it actually was an early photograph of the rockery before it had a large pond and we worked out the story of the pond being filled in apparently yeah. when it rained a lot there would be a lot of damage in that area and so that was very frustrating and messy but also one of the governors in the 1960s, he had a conifer connect collection, which he'd planted in the rockery and they kept disappearing. So people would sneak in the front gate and steal the, um, steal the, the conifers. And apparently this happened and then it was flooded again and he was just so fed up, he said, let's just flood it and make it a pond. So now it's the um, Japanese pond. And in fact, just getting back to this, this image and uh, to Sir Ernest Clark, who was the governor from 1933 to 45, which if my sums are correct, that's 12 years. He was the, um, let me see if I can get this right. He was, he's known as the longest serving or the second longest serving governor. I think George Arthur, 1824 to 36, was just slightly longer. But for a trivia question, who was the longest serving Tasmanian vice regal representative? It was neither of them. It was the um, long serving uh, chief justice who kept being put in as lieutenant governor. So that was about 14 years. So Nichols, Nichols, was yes. it? So yes. Herbert yes. Nichols. Mm. So he was the longest serving vice regal representative to date. Okay, there we are. Now I mentioned a few frames back the 1841, 1840, buildings that were built with, as part of the Magnetic Observatory. This is one of them. It's a hexagonal building made of sandstone, obviously, and it had lots of very interesting um, instruments in it. But for those of you who might travel into Government House through its rear drive, you will see that the second house in is a 1960s style weatherboard. Unfortunately, it's colonised that. 
um, which is a shame because that is a very, very important historical building, but it's now subsumed within so it's still uh, the there. Weather board. It's mm. still very much yes. there. So that some of the external mm. walls are visible, but it's kind of covered up. with. And, and what it is, I don't know how on earth they've managed to do it, but that building inside has been turned into three very peculiar bedrooms. Yes. So we'll just leave it there. Yes. Okay. This is a very interesting image too. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Um, it's by the artist Ludwig Be Becker, and it's 1852 and it's one of the early regatta years. <clears throat> the reason we think this is an important uh, painting is because if you look up at the top left as you look at the image, there's a construction there, and that was called the pavilion. And that's where the lieutenant governor and his mates used to sit and watch the regatta. But more to the point, that's why that whole area is called Pavilion Point, because of that pavilion. Mm. So it's quite useful. Yes, so the regatta was in a, a different spot. spot. Yes, but that's effectively government house would be about where the microphone is. Hmm. Now, here's another one. Here, come on, folks. Who, who recognises that building? No. The exhibition building. Yes. yes, well done. Yes. Now, it's, in, in a way, it's got nothing to do with government house. I just find that it's the most wonderful image, considering that Soon after that exhibition was over 18, was it 1895, 96? It was just knocked down. Yes, yeah. we do have some images in the book of government house staff tags of those who were permitted in yes, or went we in as, as guests. Yeah, but um, yeah. anyhow. Ah, yes. This is an image of one of the government Gore house Brown. families. It's the Gore Browns, and. Um, we became really interested in looking at the people who lived in Government House, as well as just the governors. So um, the first governor, the first family to be in the new Government House, they had a large number of children. Ten, so I think, the yeah. Fox Youngs. So the Fox Youngs had, I think, Ten, eight, eight. I think, eight, yes, eight, the world's yeah. had the biggest. Oh, right. But they, the Fox Youngs had a, um, a lot of children, and their last daughter was born in Government House. And this is the Gore Browns, three of their children here on horses, and they, two of their children were born at Government House too, two yes. laser children. So this is the governor here on the left, and um, the three children here, and Lady do we Gore think Brown, Lady, Gore, yes. Lady Gore Brown. Yes. And that's, was, that's Mr Chichester, the private secretary. Yes, yes. who lost his eye. To a champagne cork. He did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so that's all right. And there he is again with his Irish wolfhound. So I also looked at how many animals they had living in the house too, just to get a sort of sense of it. And most of the families had, had dogs and certainly um, Gore Brown. He was often called just Governor Brown, wasn't he? I think and his so. wife, even though his name was Thomas, his wife called him Gore. Gore. Mm. Mm. And there's an interesting little um, mountain sort of stand behind him. And that's still in the stables. Today. Yes, we've still got that in the stables. And also, um, he's standing in what we uh, today call the Lion's Court. So he's just, in, just outside of those main double green doors where you would go in as a guest. Yes. So there we are. 1861 to 1868 he was. This is a very interesting image as well. Um, if you think of the Royal Tasmanian Botanical Gardens and if you think of the smallish car park that's near the river, that would be just out of the screen here. And the building that is slightly to the right of centre, and indeed the other buildings as well, was the Governor's private boat shed and what was it? A swimming? Bathing house. Bathing house. Yes. Bathing house, and they also had boats, so they often kept their boats there. Mm -hmm. So Sir Robert Hamilton, who was governor in the 1880s, 80s, yes. he had a little boat there, and another governor had a little blue boat that was stolen. Something like that. So we found, um, using Trove, which was a fabulous resource to find out lots of trivia, but mm. fascinating information about how they were living in those days here. Um, yeah, lots of information. That's where we found out about Huge amounts of the information. stolen blue boats. Yes, and in, and in fact, I mean, just the story alone of, of this is very interesting because when the railway came through, I think it immediately became a practical barrier. 
And so as time went by, governors used these uh, less and less. <clears throat> and we found Trove information, including in the form of letters, to, through to about the 1910s, around about then. Later, later. It was later still, even. Yes, They were still there as, as remnant buildings. Uh, they were dangerous. They had graffiti and sort of mm. horrible stuff written all over them. Whereas the fishermen were saying, this is not the governors anymore, we can fish from here and so on and so forth. Mm. Yes. But if you do walk along the waterfront there, you can still see tiny remnant bits of metal you can. associated with those. This is a very intriguing story. <clears throat> in December of 2015, I had reason to be in London uh, during Christmas. And on Boxing Day, my partner, Leisha, and I went to, uh, where did we go to? To, to, Kew Gardens. to Kew Gardens. And in Kew Gardens, there's a freestanding brick home. And that home is dedicated to an artist whose name I've already forgotten, the famous colonial Victorian Marion Botanical North. Art, Marion North. This freestanding brick home um, is dedicated to her botanical artworks. It's full of them. <clears throat> and the day we went there, there was a table in the middle of the front room, and on top of the table was a glass display box with a platypus in it. And it had just been donated from Marianne North's personal collection, her descendants. It had only been there for about a week. And the little caption said, uh, platypus from Government House Tasmania, so I nearly fell over. <laughs> and I pursued the story, and Marion North, when she was in Tasmania, she stayed at Government House and she had a diary. And she wrote in her diary that a platypus used to live in the South Terrace fountain, and it used to come up and, up and down the steps. And then she said, one day the silly thing fell off the steps and broke its back. So she had it stuffed and mounted and took it home. Yes. So there it is. Yes. And so we found quite a few platypus stories mm. as we did our research. So I think the British were really fat fascinated by the platypus. They long had been. It took them a long time to work out about its egg laying and, you know, the fact that it was a monotreme and there was a lot of scientific interest in it. So they tended to um, get platypus to live in the various ponds at Government House. And Sir James? James. Uh, James or O'Grady. O'Grady. The O'Grady's yeah. had platypus. So yes. he got six platypus and put them in the quarry pond and was sure that they were breeding and he would take people down mm. to look at them. And the Cross family also had a platypus. And we did our research in all sorts of ways, as well as using Trove and um, lots of and the archives and so on. We did some interviews. And Susanna Sitwell, who was Susanna Cross, comes to Tasmania periodically from England. So she was terrific. She was, her father was governor, Sir Ronald Cross, in the 1950s. She was a child and she had a governess at Government House with her, with her sister. And she told me that they had a pet platypus which used to come up steps and they'd feed it worms to the front door, which is extraordinary. But they also had a wallaby and she used to take the wallaby around on a lead. <laughs> And when the Queen Mother was visiting Government House, she was really keen to um, see Susanna's wallaby. So you can imagine Susanna leading the wallaby around on a lead and showing it to the Queen Mother. This image is, I think you said, Kate, 1921? Yes, yes. And I think you've got a very interesting story about it. Yes, so this shows, this image shows the early Wilmot Wall, which is that there and then it comes at right angles so it's interesting for two reasons first of all because it's the early Wilmot wall and it was early Wilmot who actually started the Royal Society so he was the founder of the Royal Society so the other interesting thing about it is it shows how the Botanical Gardens has now encroached on the Government House Garden and so now um, this the division goes straight along the wall there. So all of that paddock there um, has really gone to the Botanical Gardens now, and that is where the, um, the Japanese garden is yes. in the Botanical Garden, yep, that's and the right. French fountain. So all of that area now is part of the Botanical Gardens. And the whole wall itself was pretty interesting because 
At that stage too, Government House had a veggie garden on this side of the wall where the vegetable garden at, Gov at Botanical Gardens is today. And I was wondering, well, how did that was very inconvenient to have it walled off in that way. So we look carefully at the structure of the wall and you can see where there are openings that have been bricked up. And of course now in this, this section of this long section of the wall, there lots of openings have been made. So you can go through the wall today. And the, yes, on yes. this side of the wall, the openings have been bricked up. So you can't go through. And bearing in mind that the wall was constructed in 1843 so that Government House wasn't there. And we expect that it being the governor's garden, that's possibly why the wall was quite fortress-like to keep people from, you know, nicking viceregal cabbages and what have you. But there is a little bit of mystery about the wall. There is an official description of it in the Royal Tasmanian Botanical Gardens, that little cottage on your left as you go in. And it says something about, about they built it to keep locusts out, which is not really appropriate because they can, locusts can fly at about a kilometre up there. So anyway. But I think locusts <clears throat> may have been a word for rascals or Could something have been. like that. Yeah. So it didn't actually mean locusts. Just getting back to the very large paddock there, as I say, that image when that image was taken, all of that belonged to Government House and it was gifted or given to the Royal Tasmanian Botanical Gardens at the time when the Tasman Bridge was being built in 1964. Um, it was something to do with the fact that land needed to be used, or I, I don't quite know the story, but there's some very acidic correspondence from the then official secretary to the government saying, how dare you give them this great big chunk of our, you know, government house. But, Yes. Anyway, it's what and now, happened. of course, we have the vineyard in that area. <clears throat> now, talking about our dear friends, the Royal Tasmanian Botanical Gardens, we've always been really very friendly, and we still are. But when the uh, Botanical Gardens Conservatory, is it called the Conservatory, the big, long, low building? It's not very low. It's a beautiful interior. When that was being opened, um, two of our statues, we have four statues in our dining room, and, and they were not on display at the time. So the Botanical Gardens said, could we borrow some of your statues and put them on our pedestals in our conservatory because they look so beautiful. And that was done, but we didn't get the two statues back. So that led to some more correspondence that was a bit uh, stiff in nature. No one's known what has happened to those two statues. That's, I happened to come across a photograph. Someone brought to me their, their old family albums shortly before we went to press actually with this book. Lo and behold, there was a photograph taken by a police officer who was working at Government House in, I think, late 20s, something like that, maybe a bit later than that. That is one of the statues, because the two that we've got is not one of them. We don't know what happened to the statue. Someone said they were left out in the rain and their plaster of Paris and they got ruined. Someone else said they fell over and their arms broke. It's a mystery. Yes. You can also see the different um, decor of the dining room at Government House. So there's that rather awful I think it's probably a flock wallpaper when that was fashionable. So, you know, fashions have changed. We've now, in the dining room, reverted to the sort of cranberry coloured walls, which that was the original. Cranberry red, yeah. yeah. Which is quite regal looking. Yeah. So I did quite a bit of research on gardeners, and this was the um, position description of one of the gardeners, Westall, in the 1950s. And it was just interesting looking at, you know, what he had to do. But I was intrigued that even then they had grapes. Mm. So certainly before we planted the vineyard yes. recently, <clears throat> grapes had gone from Government House. But they'd been there since the um, early days. So they had grapes there from the 1850s onwards. But yes, at some indeed. stage they must have decided to stop growing them. Okay. But yep. yes, he was an interesting fellow. According to Susanna, he had a little drinking problem and um, there were lots of bottles secreted around the garden. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun reading some of the materials in our archive at Government Indeed. House about the staff. It was intriguing. Oh, the staff alone is just the most wonderful story. And there we have another staff member. Yes, so we also had an interview with the Dickenberg family. So, um, and this is taken in the kitchen yard. Hmm. And at that time they had dairy cows and that is Marinus Dickenberg. Marinus Dickenberg, yeah. And his son, and that's his milking pail. So that was just interesting to know what was happening. So the days of the crosses again. Hmm. So they generally had a little farm at Government House. 
sheep and, and, and cows and so on until about that time. Yeah. But it's not that long ago, really. No, that's 60, early 60s, no, early yeah. 50s? 50s, 60s, they were there. This is an interesting one. Uh, Kate has spoken about, you know, I think you mentioned that the, the, some of the governors, certainly the British governors, used to bring in their own teachers and the, the kids were homeschooled at Government House. This is a group of, of people who have come from England um, and they've arrived at Tobart Airport in 1951. And one of them is Ray Pegler, who is still very much with us. I think she lives in Queensland. She does, yes. So yes. there she is in the middle. So she yes. came out with yes. a group of other staff to Government House. And there's the official secretary, Eric Stop, Eric Stop and yes. his wife. That's right. But the rest of that group were all um, English people who came to work So it was quite standard House back then to, to, to import bring staff. staff. And this is a, a, a young, at the time, her name was Diane Smith. She is, again, Kate in particular had some decent correspondence with her. Yes, I met her at yeah. Tanaminaway's day um, a couple of years ago, and she told me she worked at Government House. So I said, what, tell me about it. And she lived in the house. So, of course, all of these staff lived in the house. They didn't live anywhere else. So she came down um, to work at Government House from the northwest coast and lived at Government House for a couple of years as a kitchen maid. So, and then, yeah. um, okay. yes, waiting staff. So this, uh, this image in the ballroom is 1967, and for those of you who have been into our ballroom will know we've got those huge three lovely mirrors on the stage. Have a look at that. They were covered with gold curtains. Again, we do not know why. What we do know is that during the Second World War, when I think the, the mirrors were being either covered up or they were being taken down for protection in case of bombing, and the, the, the workers bringing them down actually broke one of the mirrors. So there's a bit of correspondence about that. But why they would have been covered up in 1967, I just don't know. OK, so there's a mystery about, um, I mentioned the 1827 image of some possible foundations. Those foundations stopped. Arthur was told, that you, don't, you haven't got the money, so don't build any more. When Sir John Franklin was the governor, 1839 or 37 to 43, he resurrected the notion of building a government house <coughs> up there on top of the domain. And there were more substantial foundations put down in 1841. There's a great deal of correspondence about it. Um, I'm convinced that our present government house has part of the at least the 1841 building in the basement. You go into some of the rooms and you can see they're quite different. Outside of the, um, this is an 1841, one of the architect's charts, and you can see there there's a set of steps, right? So that's 1841. That's today, and there the steps are. We call them the steps to nowhere, because yeah. obviously you can go through the green door in and out, but look where those steps terminate. And we do know from Porton Kay's plans, he's the architect of today's government house. He'd written on his plans on, the, on top of, this is on top of the existing foundations. So we know that they, he used the same foundations. Which they would have done again as practical individuals. But, um, it, it, and, but again, it's, it's, it, there is mystery involved, and it would take a real heritage architect, I think, a team to work their way through to tell us definitively what that was all about. And just another mystery, because we're conscious of the time now, you can see there that says stairs to orchestra. Now, if you think of our ballroom, up at the back of our ballroom, we've got the minstrel's gallery. The only way to get into the minstrel's gallery is through a door that's right next to the main door of the royal suite. Now, can you imagine in the 19th century having musicians with their music walking past the royal suite. No. So what was planned was a stairwell up to the other end of the minstrel's gallery. Um, and there it is. There's the plan. It was never built. We know that they ran out of money uh, at, at, when they were building this part. Of the, this, this was the last part of the building that was being constructed. They ran out of money. And so they never built those. But when you go into that internal cavity, you can see the preparation work for stairs. And down at the ground level now, that's a toilet. Yes, so David and I have done lots of crawling around in strange places Plenty. in the house to try and work out, you know, what was, where everything was and where they changed their minds Indeed. about things and where they bricked up doors. And so there have been quite a few changes, mm. interesting changes over the years. Well, we've put this image in because this is an image of a garden party. So a garden party at Government House would at least annual events. I mean, there were, there were lots of them. 
when I was researching how they used the house and grounds, certainly garden parties were a big thing. Um, really, from the early days and right through until when would they, they Look, stopped? I think the last garden party was really the Coxes Bill had Cox. a fair, farewell garden party. But certainly when I was a young woman, garden parties at Government House were an annual thing. And so this is a picture of a garden party. And what is intriguing, it's showing this a building here, which is the fernery. And I'd read a lot about the fernery and picked up things about the fernery and thought, where is the fernery? So this was um, yeah, a building on the east terrace of Government House. So it's interesting because it shows the fernery, which has been a bit of a mystery, and Susanna Cross told us about that. But also it's interesting from a garden point of view because it shows this round circular bed here. And when we looked at aerial plans or aerial photographs of Government House, we saw that they had some fascinating geometric shaped beds on the south terrace and on the east terrace. So there was a star bed and there were circles and they were really elaborate beds. So um, there you can just see the circular bed in the and background. We've got a close up of the, uh, the fernery again. I think that is one of the few bits and pieces that's left of it, is that yes, right? Yes, that's a remnant of the fernery. That's all that's left there. Mm. And um, the next one I think shows you where it is. Yes. So. The fernery would be just in front of where the buildings are, yes, so stretching it's in across the, that little yes, roadway. Yes, and in behind. Yeah, so it was quite a substantial building. Uh, this is going into the interior, and the reason we are showing you these is, is these beautiful skylights, because when the building was built in the 1850s, a lot of the architecture was obviously cutting edge, but also very Victorian. And among the most elaborate um, of the uh, of the interior architecture was the ability to bring light down. So just looking at those three, we've got the skylight right up at the top on the roof, leading down to the, with the uh, veranda or the iron balustrade on the first floor, and then Penn Taylor lay on her back on the main uh, hallway on the ground floor and took that other photograph. Yes. So very cutting edge it was. Yes, so this is just outside the Royal Suite and the door Go, it goes through to the... That's the Minstrel's Gallery. The Minstrel's Gallery yeah. over the ballroom, just so to get you. This is a very interesting image. That is Governor Sir Harry Barron, 1909 to 1913. And in the middle is his wife, Lady Clara Barron. And do you recognise who they're with? Billy Hughes. Billy Hughes. He, the reason I've put it in there is partly because of the interesting legacy of Billy Hughes, but also I just think it's a really nice image. and. Uh, Baron was the Premier of WA for quite some time. So that's what that is. That's actually cropped from a larger, I think he must have been with the Parliament or something. Mm. Anyhow, there we are. Jumping way back in time to 1868, that was the first ever royal visit to the new government house and they went completely bananas, including that bonfire on the top of the mountain. Yes, yeah. And so he was the second son of Queen Victoria, the Duke of Edinburgh. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they really absolutely, well, you know, this was little England, wasn't it? Okay. William Laddie was dressed up and introduced to, um, to, to the Duke the, of Edinburgh. Duke. Yes, another. Oh, this was researching balls. And this gorgeous little scrapbook is in the university special collection. Probably right near your collection. Yeah, so it's, it is actually it's all part of the same. Oh, well, there we are. So that's all what right. these images are from. Yes. yes. So this is um, Sarah Mitchell's scrapbook, and the sketches are Kate Mitchell's sketches. And extraordinary, this is a sketch of them riding home from the Government House Ball. So they lived at Liz Dillon on the East Coast, and they rode to the ball. It took them a couple of days. And then they rode home again. And um, Miss Allen fell off somewhere near Richmond. Yes, so we've got- That's right. Uh, Miss Allen falling off near Richmond Taz, 1872. Interesting sort of title. Oh, this is coming close to home now. Yes, so I popped this um, image in the book. This is Dick's grandmother, Coralie Flexmore, and she was a debutante at Government House. 
And what particularly interested me about her was looking at the Flexmores. The, um, the Flexmoor, he was, her forebear was a second fleeter and his wife was a first fleeter. They were convicts. And it was interesting that within one generation, they were on the government house guest list. And then Coralie, um, down another generation or two, was a debutant at government house. And I thought, isn't that amazing? Mm. If they'd stayed in England, if Elizabeth Bruce and um, Frances Flexmore had stayed in England, there's no way that she would have yeah. been a debutant at government house. Yep. Or at Buckingham Palace. That's just another image to show you, just like Kate was saying earlier about the garden parties, how the balls were just balls such were a big, big deal thing. on the social calendar. Yes. So each year they had a birthday ball. And the first birthday ball was, I think, in 1860, because it took them a little yes. time to yes. finish the ballroom. That was the last part of the house mm -hmm. finished. So this is a 1930s yeah. ball. Just very quickly. No social distancing. No. <laughs> They fitted hundreds of people in there. So it was great fun doing the research to find out, you know, just the descriptions at, yes, of yes. Yeah, oh, just fantastic. the flowers and the clothes and the music, the whole thing. Just before we move on the slide, you'll see on, on the top there, there's three internal double windows. Those are still there, but their frosted glass is, is becoming incredibly fragile and quite loose in the frames. And so actually as part of the post-COVID um, impetus to get um, tradespeople back to work and so on and so forth. We secured some funding for certain heritage maintenance um, issues and those six windows are going to be carefully taken out and having uh, glass put on them as, as protection and then put back in their frames. It's not cheap to do but if you think about how important this building is it's worth every cent. This could be the last image. It's on the conservatory veranda as it was then. It, it was only roofed in in about 1990 and I guess we just think it's an interesting image. It's at a garden party. Just, we just think what do they say? I think they're um, they're looking scandalously at someone and they're having a little bit of a gossip but it, it is also interesting to know what that area of the house yes, was like. Yes it was just unroofed and I think that's it. Good. So there we are. So you want to field questions? Or it's, if yes, anyone's got a question, we'll certainly do yeah, our best. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to know if you drained the Poe pool to see what the <laughs> was in. Well, look, that is Dunstan such a good diving. question because about, was it about four years ago? Yes. Um, when, when Kate was the governor, she invited the University of Tasmania dive team to go down and have a look. <laughs> and they spent a good few hours in, in yeah, the pond. Yeah. But, you know, the visibility is just about zero. And I think their, their sort of technical equipment was good, but not sufficient. All they were able to say is, look, there's about that much sludge at the bottom. But, you know, they're, they're, it's worth doing one day. It is. Yes, and there are lots of eels down there too, as well as as well as goldfish, which make it really murky. Well, they could be tench. You might know more than us. Acclimatisation. Um, I think it was in 1875 that six tench were introduced, and in fact, those are in the minutes of the Royal Society. Six tench were introduced, and I believe they are biologically reasonably similar to goldfish. So who knows? We could have hybrids down there. Some of them look exactly lots... like goldfish. Others yeah. are just about black. So they're really interesting. Yeah. So, um, in one of the photos, uh, the aerial photos uh, of the what is now part of the botanical garden, yes, the big paddock, there are, seem to be three or four po poles uh, ranged yeah. across that paddock. Would that have been electricity or telephone? Well, 1921. Possibly. What did we have possibly. in the 20s? Pro Possibly. Yeah, I think possibly. Yes, yeah. yes. And in fact, there's some very distinctive um, telephone type poles, which if you look at the image uh, photographs from that period and a bit before, that are now just lying in a big bunch outside the ABC next to the, the uh, Buddhist place next to it. They're just lying there in the open. Beautiful, beautiful old telephone poles. Yes. I have a question. I know um, 
During COVID, Kate, you were wonderful to inspire people with your panda and poo adventures. Yes. With the little creatures. Have that, has that been incorporated into the history of Government House? Because I think it should be. No, I'm not sure. No, we didn't put Padra. I don't think there's a mention there, but we've got all the images and they might actually end up having their own book. <laughs> yes. We do have to speak, but there are copyright issues, though. Yes, poo was a bit of a problem. But we could get over Panda that. is fine, but poo, We yes. could just misspell We poo. tried to, yes. <laughs> so it can be very expensive. Yes, ma'am. Um, is it perhaps in Main Road? Sir Ogilvy, that apparently belonged to one of the governors too, when you were talking about the oh, right. docking houses around that were government houses. Oh, yes. Is but that uh, Tower Road? To, so I can't remember its name. That was supposed to be a holiday house for one of the, or weekend oh. house for one of the governors. Is that the, the tower like building in Tower Road? Yes. It's yes. I, I've never read anything to that effect, but who knows? It could have been privately owned. I mean, they. But yeah. by the by a governor, like yes. That. We were always told. Yes, it could have been privately owned by a governor, but I, there's no suggestion that it's was owned by been, the yeah, state. Yeah, yeah. Apart from that story of the indigenous people being brought as sort of displays, which is pretty awful, was there any contact at all between government health and the indigenous people? Yes, there was. We do know, because Kate found this, is that soon after Sir Henry Fox Young became the governor, well, about six months after, he actually paid a visit yeah. to one of the, what, was it Oyster Cove? Yes. Which was probably or possibly quite unusual for a governor to actually go and do that. It's not, it's not known why he did it, but yes. he certainly did make you know, some form of effort. Yes, and Cassandra Pybus tells me that Gore Brown had Aboriginal skulls too, and he even displayed one on the mantelpiece in Governor's room. On the other I side, of she's, the, she's sorry, writing a story yeah. about is all she? of this, yeah. so yeah. I guess we will know more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's pretty gruesome. On the other side of the ledger, there was a quite controversial lawyer and politician by the name of Norman K. Ewing. Don't know if the name rings a bell. He was the, the administrator on quite a few occasions at Government House, particularly, I think, when, was it in the 20s, when governors were pretty much on the nose here, and in fact, Government House was in danger of folding and becoming something else. But Norman K. Ewing, at one point when he was actually administering the state, he went up to, I think it was, uh, was it Big Dog Island, for about a week, mutton birding, which is quite unusual again mm. for a white fella yes. back mm. then. Mm. Don't know why. Yes, he's a... An interesting fellow, mm, mm, mm. In your last answer, you, you sort of give the impression that at some stage Government House was under threat. Uh, yes. Um, What's the story behind it? The story was primarily that a lot of local people, and it was through the Parliament really, saying, look, we're Tasmanians, why do we have to import our governor from the mother country? And that was, the, that was their spiel. And it, it became a really big deal in the parliament, so much so that um, I think it was William Allardyce, who was a British governor, 1918 to 20 or something, he actually said, I'm not being paid enough. And in fact, the British governors were a little bit miffed because they were given a lump sum when they arrived. And out of that was their salary, all their traveling expenses, all their social expenses. So if they were to do the right thing as the governor, they then said, well, I'm ending up with very little by way of personal salary. So. There was a bit of both, but in the end, Government House was empty for a total of six years. Not six consecutive years, probably three and three. Hence all the need for plenty of local administration. Yes. But also there was all sorts of correspondence about what to do with the building. You know, everything from a convalescent home for ex-military people to part, part of the university. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yes, I think since, you know, after Federation, there was this, well, what are we, do we still, are we going to have state governors still? And so there was that, first of all, so there was always that feeling for quite a lot of years. Mm. And, and there was always great respect for them as governors, as individuals. It was just, don't be a Brit. We've got our own. But it was only Sir Stanley who became, Sir Stanley Burberry was the first Australian-born governor in 1975. And, of course, Sir Guy Green was the first Tasmanian-born governor in 1995 to 2003. Mm. 